angels waging war in the unseen realm. Global events fulfilling biblical prophecy, eternal life. What lies beyond mortality? From analyzing the paranormal from a biblical worldview to the discussion of cutting edge science and technology, conspiracy, discovery, special investigative reports. Unafraid to explore the challenging issues facing humanity. Welcome to another edition of Skywatch TV. The greatest cover-up in history is the cover-up of history. So says Steve Quayle. Welcome to Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. Our guest today, the director and producer, director and uh, writer and star of the new film. The topic today, True Legends, The Unholy Sea. Watch this. They say this thing had been dead for maybe a day or two. Uh, we estimated his size at approximately 12 to 10 feet tall. The giant killed the first team that they came across. He was extremely big and fast and agile for a guy that size. The popes and the agents of the Holy See have known about the giants for many centuries. And do you believe that they have artifacts from the past that would help explain some of what's going on? Absolutely sure. The Vatican knows all the secrets. secretly preparing for the arrival of alien saviors. They seem to be intentionally creating dogma that is going to position the Roman Catholic Church to be at the forefront of an official disclosure moment. The Vatican is involved in ufology in ways that they can't even imagine. So while we're standing here in the headquarters of the Jesuits, tell us about Mount Graham. They are constantly monitoring things with the Lucifer device. Sometimes they have to wait for all of the UFOs to get out of the way. I would like to tell you more about Zechariah Sitchin. He told me, John Mario, one night I wake up and I saw an Anunnaki sitting on my bed. History is being repeated. The days of Noah are returning. The gods are returning to the earth to dwell among men and mingle their seed with the human race. Only the truth can prepare us for the lie that's coming. In studio with me, my best friend and wife, co-host of Sci Friday on the Skywatch TV channel on Roku, Sharon Gilbert. Hi, honey. Hi, sweetheart. And the uh, writer and director of True Legends, The Unholy Sea, Tim Alberino. Tim, welcome. Pleasure to be here. Uh, You're supposed to say hi, honey. Well, hi, honey. Yeah, hi, honey. Uh, see, see, that's my motivation. <laughs> uh, Steve, in the, in the film, uh, Steve Quayle, who produced the film, uh, said the greatest cover-up in history is the cover-up of history. 
How, what does he mean? Well, uh, that the, the history of the pre-flood world is, is, has been completely covered over and covered up, literally. That, that we have evidence, and there exists evidence all over the earth of the dynamics of the reality of the pre-flood world um, and the Genesis 6 narrative that has been intentionally ignored uh, at best, and in many cases, intentionally covered over, hmm. and uh, artifacts have been confiscated, history has been literally rewritten, and um, the, the archaeological establishment, as well as, the, uh, as, well as the, um, the educational establishment, would like us to believe that thousands of years ago, mankind was Neanderthalic, mm -hmm. and uh, that we were in the infancy of our species, and we were banging stones together, and, and, uh, and barely able to, to build a mud hut, let alone the amazing megalithic structures that are present all over the earth, standing in testimony, testifying in themselves of a superior, uh, a superior race society, a superior past that has been completely ignored. Well, if they allow us to even uh, venture down that road, they'll say, no, no, those were aliens. And right. they came here and they seated with right. the Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard you talk just on the program that was recorded just a few minutes ago with Tom Horn. You were talking about uh, churches being built over ancient sites. When, of course, when I was growing up, when I was going to college, we were told over and over again that was to reclaim those ancient sites. Sort of the people locally would, you know, trust the church, and, and it was sort of a syncretistic moment. Is it different than that? Is there a darker motive to it that? It is that and something more. Uh, obviously, um, part of the reason why the, why the Church of Rome will take over an ancient pagan site is to, it's, it's a show of dominance, to plant the flag of the, of the Pope of Rome, of the Holy See, and it, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's, they've conquered this pagan civilization. That's mm -hmm. the way that they used to, the mm -hmm. conquistadors, especially in Peru, were conquering these, they had the right to conquer in the name of God these pagan civilizations and in the name of the, uh, of the Holy Roman Church. This was their attitude. This was their mentality. So, so when, they, when they would conquer these pagan institutions, these pagan civilizations, they would find their most holy sites, and they would put churches on them mm. as a show of dominance. That's one level. That's one reason why they did it, but there are other levels. And, and, I, and in our film, we prove that there's more to it than just, you know, sticking the flag of Rome uh, over the, the most holy pagan sites. It's about artifacts, and it's about knowledge. Mm. At the end of the day, knowledge is the most precious commodity on earth. Mm. And, and, and there's another level, too, uh, which is the treasure that is associated with not only these ancient cultures, but specifically mm -hmm. with the bodies and the remains of giants. Mm. Uh, because we have discovered uh, that not only in the case in Peru, but also in other places, especially in Sardinia, which will be the subject matter of our next episode, we have discovered that in many cases, when the bodies and the tombs of these giants are, are unearthed, they're, they're often accompanied by vast amounts of gold mm. and treasure. Mm. And we've, we, we have discovered that there is an underground black market that deals in the trade of these ancient artifacts, including bones of, of giants and other entities that existed in the pre-flood world. Other entities? That's right. Oh, okay. You expand Can't on let that, that go by. Yeah. Got to hear that. Well, many people are aware uh, uh, by now of, of the elongated skull phenomenon. Sure. And uh, we we postulated. And, and in fact, I've been doing some research on that myself, and I'm finding out that that is something that uh, you know most people are aware of the Paracas skulls from Peru. But what they aren't aware of is that the in the pre-flood world in ancient Mesopotamia, Sumer, the pre uruk culture, and Uruk would be the city that was the center of Nimrod's mm -hmm. kingdom. So we're talking about 3,000 BC there. Mm -hmm pre-flood, what they call the uh, Ubaid culture, which dates back to about 5,000, 6,000 BC, not long after humanity got kicked out of the garden. Mm -hmm. Every single skull dug out of the earth at Eridu, which was the city that was devoted to the god of the abyss, Enki, uh, every single one, 204 human, sets of human remains, every single one had deformed crania. They practiced cranial deformation. Now, right. we're, now, the, the, the archaeologists weren't looking for that. They don't know how to explain it. It could be that it was done artificially through head wrapping or whatever. But the, the question to ask is, why were they doing it? What were they... Because that's also the city where they found all those little lizard-like figurines. Well, this, this, this begs the question. 
if the elongation of the skulls is more than just uh, artificial? Mm -hmm. Is it genetic? Mm -hmm. Is it genetic? And right. obviously, yeah. there's definitely headboarding going on in these other uh, and cultures. And, 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 and by the way, sure. we talk about elongated skulls in our film. But um, the uh, uh, when you when you when you artificially uh, um, deform a, cr a human cranium, mm -hmm. you don't get more mass. You're right. just no. working with the mass that's already right. present. So just you can reshaping. you can reshape it into a conical form or some other kind of a form, uh, but you don't get more mass, and right. you certainly don't get. Uh, larger brains and, and a larger... Oh, no. In right, fact, right. it can cause neurological deficits. Exactly. Right. So when we, when we encounter a lot, of, a lot of many of these elongated skulls, because there are thousands all mm -hmm. over the earth, uh, uh, I believe are representative of a divergent genetic species. Mm -hmm. Divergent from us. Yeah. And, and here's the other thing that, that the scholars, and, and you can find it if you dig into the academic papers that are written about this Ubaid culture. Again, it's not a main area of study for these scholars. They know about it. It's, for them, it's like a curiosity. They want to talk more about the style of pottery. Exactly. But those deformed crania, they're found all over the Levant, even as far away as places like Jericho and northern Syria. Yeah. But they all disappear after the flood, when this Uruk culture comes up, which is, again, Nimrod's kingdom post-flood. It goes away. Right. The flood wiped, wiped it out. Now, it comes back again later, but again, for the most part, it disappeared. So yeah, and that's one of the points that we make in this film. When we talk about the, the pre-flood world, when we talk about the world before the flood of Noah, we're not just dealing with giants. We're dealing with a host of genetic aberrations yeah. that came as a result of, uh, of, the, of the illicit activity of the, of the mm -hmm. fallen watchers that were commingling their genetics with that of the human race. Mm -hmm. Well, if he had to take out every, the Lord God took out everything that breathed. Everything. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. slate was wiped clean. What's interesting, though, is that the Bible says everything that was on land. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, and, and what we have later on in, 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 we talk about Sumer. In our film, we make the case that Sumer, when you say Sumer, you're, it, that word is synonymous with Nimrod and the Tower of Babel mm -hmm. and, the, and the kingdom that he founded in the plains of Shinar. Right. And so the Sumerian culture was the culture of Nimrod. Yes. And mm -hmm. so, um, so in our film, we, and, we, and we talk about... And he the, was trying to rebuild, in, in my view, in my research, he was trying to rebuild that, that pre-flood temple that existed in that city of Eridu. That's which right. Was the, mm -hmm. yes. That's right. There yes. seems to be an indication that they chose the plains of Shinar to rebuild the empire that existed before right. the, 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 the flood of Noah. That decimated this, this, this empire. Now, this is important. The work of the occult, of the mystery schools, is to regain the knowledge of the lost watchers and resurrect their empire. Mm. That's what the Luciferian, that's their end game. Mm. That is the end game of the Luciferian elite. And so now what's, what's the Vatican's role in all of this? Well, I mean, wouldn't you think if, if they're a Christian organization, and I'm posing this to you so you can challenge this or, or whatever, you, however you choose to respond, but you would think that a Christian denomination would want Christendom to be aware of this so that we would be prepared for what is coming. Why are they holding this information so close to well, the vest? We make a very controversial case in our film, and we say that the roots of Rome, of the Church of Rome, go back to the Tower of Babel and the Babylonian priesthood. Mm. That's the case that we make in our film. Do you have a paper trail for that? Oh, we do, well, yeah, we, we, show some, 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 uh, we, we show some proofs why mm -hmm. we believe that. Uh, for example, I'll give you just one very simple, superficial thing, is that the, the fish head miters that they wear mm -hmm. are the representative of the fish head miters that were worn by the Sumerian priests and the priests of Babylon. The Abgal. Yes. That's they, right. They, they, ser and, they served in the, in the temple of uh, a, a goddess named Nanshi. Yeah. Yes, and it specifically references um, uh, what, what, what we, who we know as Dagon. Yes. Um, so, and he was known as Oannes to the Greeks. Yeah. And uh, this was, according to myth, an individual, a, a, a hybrid person, a half fish, half man thing that came out of the sea mm -hmm. and began to instruct mankind in the lost knowledge that existed mm -hmm. before the flood of like Noah. Like Cthulhu. I have a uh, paper that you need to read, an academic paper you need to read. Um, a fellow from Estonia named Amar Anus wrote a paper about six years ago on the Mesopotamian origins of the Watchers. Oannes was Very interesting. one of the Apkalu. He, he was one of the, yes, he mm -hmm. was called Oana Adapa yeah. yes. in, uh, in, uh, in the Sumerian legend. Mm -hmm. And Oana Adapa, according to their legend, and this is, this is ubiquitous in that region, right. not just Mesopotamia, the Greeks, the Romans, Oana Adapa came out of the sea mm -hmm. after the flood of Noah, right. reteaching the mysteries yes. uh, that were lost in the flood. And I find that interesting because the Bible makes a case, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. states uh, definitively that all, everything on land was destroyed. But yeah. I always wondered, well, what about 
what might have been in the sea. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. here he comes Especially out of the, the sea. Abyss. He comes out of the sea yes. and the abyss, which is associated with the sea. And right. in fact, the Sumerians, according to the cylinder, uh, the, 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 the cylinder seals and the Sumerian tablets, the, Sum the Sumerians summoned this entity who you referenced, mm -hmm. Enki, yeah. from the abyss, from the Abzu. They right. summoned him. And then where they summoned, the location where they summoned him, mm -hmm. they, they built a temple called the Aabzu. Right which many archaeologists now believe was the foundation of the Tower of Babel. Exactly, yes. at the city of yes. Eridu. Yeah, yes. that's right. And we're on the same so, page. So, so there's something more with the Tower of Babel than just a tall building. Right, This right. was, they, were, they had summoned an entity there who very well, uh, Enki, is, Enki is basically the Lucifer in yeah. the mm -hmm. Sumerian legend. Absolutely. Um, um, but they, so they summon Enki from the abyss, and then right on top of that location, very possibly, they build this tower. Mm -hmm. So the Tower of Babel was, was uh, there was a lot more to that than, mm -hmm. what, than what people uh, 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 usually think. So when the, Va the, the, the Vatican, the Holy See, and Holy See, when the Roman Catholic Church takes over these pagan sites, they now control everything within mm -hmm. it. Are these pagan sites more than just archaeological digs? Are they also portals? I think that there's evidence to show that they may be. Mm. And uh, this is the arcane, not, this, the knowledge, this is the knowledge that the occult is working to re recover, is the knowledge that was lost in the great, I call the empire of the gods. Mm -hmm. um, and it, 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 that's what they want. And so we have to understand that there is a Luciferian faction, a very strong Luciferian faction within the Holy See, not exclusive to the mm -hmm. Holy See. This is a dark brotherhood that exists. These are the mystery adepts that have existed, they're, they're, they're following a lineage that goes back hundreds of years, actually that goes back to the Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. I would say the majority of Catholics have no have idea. Have no clue. And right. that's, I want to make a distinction. We're not taking aim at Catholics. No, no. no. Uh, I, believe I that, was one for 10 years. Yeah, yeah. so, so I, we have nothing against Catholics. <laughs> and many of your view, our viewers may be Catholics as well. We're yes, not right. talking about you. We're talking about the core, the hidden core, right. within the elite at the very top. That's right. And I think a lot of Catholics probably, as we're talking about this stuff, are probably thinking about circumstances where they can say, yeah, you know what? It is kind of strange that there's a Catholic church there and there's a monastery there. And mm -hmm. So um, the, it's about the knowledge. And so obviously there's knowledge associated with the artifacts. There's knowledge associated with the, with the documents and just the knowledge of the pre-flood world. Mm -hmm. Because... And this is what I always tell people in terms of the relevance of this information of our film. And all of this is in our film, uh, True Legends, the Unholy Sea. Um, it's, the, the reason why it's so important and crucial for us to understand is because history is going full circle. Mm -hmm. Back to the beginning. Yeah. And I say in the film, and the Vatican's leading the parade. Like what an has, Ouroboros. What has been That's will be precisely. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a good time to break. This is a fascinating conversation. I would love to extend this beyond the 28 minutes and 30 seconds we have, but you're just going to have to be content with that. And then get the film, we'll tell you how. And <laughs> Sky Watch TV will continue right after this. Those who control the past control the future. And no organization on earth has a tighter grip on the official history than the Roman Catholic Church. Skywatch TV is proud to offer the documentary film True Legends, The Unholy Sea, featuring producer Steve Quayle and host director Timothy Alberino. Watch as they connect the dots and present evidence of a long plot to cover up the history of the pre-flood world and to prepare humanity for the arrival of our space brothers bringing a different gospel. Order The Unholy Sea and Skywatch TV will include a copy of the best-selling book Exo Vaticana. True Legends, The Unholy Sea, and Exo Vaticana, both for just $34.95. Order now by calling toll-free 844-750-4985 or log on to skywatchtvstore.com. Welcome back to Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert along with Sharon Gilbert. Uh, please, please check out the other web exclusives on skywatchtv.com. The daily news updates into the multiverse with Josh Peck and Christina Peck. And of course, every Friday we take a look at science through a Christian lens with our science advisor who just happens to be sitting at the end of the table here. Uh, you'll find that at skywatchtv.com and the Skywatch TV channels on Roku and on YouTube. Uh, Tim Alberino, uh, boy, we, we, there, there's so much going on right here right now that, that my brain is going a half dozen different directions. I mean, archaeologically, the evidence is there to support what you're saying. I mean, in 2003, archaeologists, British archaeologists, found the tomb of Gilgamesh, they believed, in what had been the course of the Euphrates River. Mm -hmm. uh, so Gilgamesh was an historic person, mm -hmm. but he is known to history as one who believed he was two-thirds God, one-third human, two-thirds God. Interestingly, the Apkalu, the Mesopotamian watchers, who came forth after the flood, and there were several of them who came forth after the flood, mm -hmm. were also two-thirds God, one-third human. 
and they recently discovered a cylinder seal in which Gilgamesh was named the master of the Apkalu and the one who brought forth, brought back the pre-flood knowledge. And, and there's reason to believe that Gilgamesh was Nimrod. There, is, there are those who will make yeah. that case. And, 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 and interesting that the Euphrates is in prophecy as yes. being a place where entities are bound and right. will be unbound in, shortly. In, right, in the end times. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so yes, there, there, so there's some just really fascinating stuff here. But I, I want to get to one that, that uh, brings it back into present day, because we tend to think that the giants are all history. Uh, those of us who accept that they were real, most people accept them as just, you know, just think myths, legends, stories. You open the film with a story that I've heard Steve Quayle talk about for a long time. We both, you know, mm -hmm. listened to mm -hmm. Steve Quayle's radio program for many years, and we've heard him tell the story about the C-130 pilot in Afghanistan who was brought in to bring out the giant. Now, being somewhat skeptical, when Steve was talking about it on his radio program, I thought, well, yeah, maybe. But you open the film with the pilot and you know, his identity's concealed, but mm -hmm. you've got somebody who's testified to it, and mm -hmm. now others have come forth and talked to other researchers as well. Yeah, that to corroborate absolutely the story. corroborates the story. And I, we, obviously, we know the pilot personally. I've seen his credentials. So, you know, tell the story for people who have not yet seen the film. First of all, he's active duty. He's flying C-130s today. So he needs to keep his identity concealed. Yes, he's he not supposed to be his identity about concealed, and, 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 um, and let's just say that he, he's... Uh, He's, he's had a little bit of persecution mm -hmm. since he's kind of been talking about this stuff, even though he's kept his identity. But other guys know who he must be. I think they know who he is. Um, at least somebody knows who he is. But anyways, so we wanted to make sure we protected him. And people would say, well, why didn't you just show his face? And if, you're, if he's really telling the truth, we want to protect the guy. Uh, um, we have reason to believe that uh, this kind of information, frankly, gets people killed. And in, in a nutshell, this individual, this pilot, flew the body of a giant that had been recently killed from Bagram Air Force Base uh, to Qatar. And uh, when he pulled into Bagram in Afghanistan, he was met on the tarmac by uh, what he later referred to as the babysitters. And he described these babysitters to us in great de detail. This is how our film opens up, by the way, mm -hmm. our, our True Legends. It opens up with this story, right. him telling the story. And the babysitters accompanied the body of the giant all the way to its final destination, which, by the way, uh, rumor has it, uh, among military personnel, that the body went to Wright Patterson, Wright -Patterson Air Force oh, Base. Sure. So, Why not? Um, so, <laughs> so anyways, uh, uh, he was told that this giant was, they encountered the giant in the caves of Afghanistan, which I, I believe they, can, they call this giant now the, 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 the giant of Kandahar, I believe, mm -hmm, or the Kandahar mm -hmm. giant or something like that. Um, and uh, so they came, they came on a, a cave, and uh, the military had, a, had a, uh, a, uh, a fight with this thing. And I don't know all the details of that part of the story, um, but ultimately it ended up getting killed, mm -hmm. and they brought it to Bagram Air Force Base. That's where our story picks up, where our pilot had to transport this body. And here's the thing. He, he, he estimated it between 10 and 12 feet tall, uh, I've heard other estimations from, from some of the guys who actually claim to have been there in the firefight with this giant. Actually, it wasn't a firefight. I guess he had some kind of a primitive weapon and they were shooting him. Where they say he was more like 15. Well, they we know how much he weighed for sure. Yeah. For sure. Because they weighed him while the pilot was there. Uh, they weighed the pellet because they had to before they put sure. it in the AC-130. And he had a lift master, our pilot, mm -hmm. uh, who was very freaked out because he had to ride in the back with the body and the babysitters. And it was not a good experience for his lift master. I imagine not. While he was piloting the, the craft, they weighed it, and it weighed a thousand pounds. It weighed eleven hundred pounds. But you take off the the straps and the and the, the pallet. And the, and the pallet. Yeah. Yeah. The guy weighed a th probably over a thousand pounds. A thousand pounds, and this was solid. The guy was like solid muscle because the pilot, you know, he 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 pounded his fist on the body, and he said this guy was like a, a brick. I mean, he was just all muscle. And uh, he was pale. He, was a, he had a pale color. He said he didn't know if that was because of the, uh, uh, the fact that he had been dead for a while. Um, but, and this happened, by the way, I think that back in 2005. And so um, he w obviously wasn't allowed to take any pictures or any notes or anything like that. But they were very frank with him. This is, uh, a, they called it a big guy. This big guy was mm -hmm, killed and, mm -hmm. and we're bringing him to, you need to bring him to Qatar. And so... Um, and again, that story has been corroborated now. Yeah, I think yeah. by at least one other source that I know, possibly two, uh, and it's well known now among military personnel. Right, right. The, the giant of, of Kandahar, 
And uh, I think uh, the, the pilot that, that we talked to in our, in our film, who contacted, eventually contacted Steve, was the first guy to go on record right, right. with this story. And I've seen a couple of other members of the uh, team that went in to take him out, uh, who, who have been interviewed as well, and corroborate the pilot's story. Corroborate the story. And they, they took some casualties. This thing didn't go down without a fight. Uh, apparently it killed some of them, and, uh, yeah. and, the, the, and our pilot was told that it was eating the uh, the individuals that it had killed. So yeah. I don't know if that's true or not, but I do know that the the body it was killed. Yeah. Did your pilot mention what sort of clothing this thing was? It wearing? was wearing primitive sort of canvas wrap uh -huh. on his feet. At least the the majority of the body was covered, but the feet were hanging uh, off of the pellet. And the pilot, along with the other crewmen and 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 some of the military guys, were were putting their feet up next to the to the feet of of the of this giant that were exposed, and his hands were exposed, and some of his hair, and um, uh, his feet were were two to three times the yeah. size. Uh, to carry of, that kind of weight it would have to be. Yeah, I mean, least. you're talking about 1,000-pound guys, so the proportions matched that weight. And, and again, the, the, now the U.S. government and the U.S. military involved in, in keeping this information a secret. Yeah, and why keep that quiet? <laughs> why? What does that have to do with military uh, intelligence and, and, and secrecy and, and security for the American Does people? the Vatican's influence reach into the U.S. military? Absolutely, oh, it does. that's a good question. Absolutely, it does. And, uh, and, and um, I didn't know if I was going to say this or not, but I will. Uh, I think it's quite interesting that we have Hillary Clinton running for president right now and her running mate is a person that is mm -hmm. very, has very strong mm -hmm. ties mm -hmm. to the Jesuit, Jesuit order. Okay. He is not a yeah. Jesuit himself, but he's Jesuit ed ed educated. He calls himself a Pope Francis Catholic. And uh, we know that Hillary Clinton's uh, health is is uh, failing rapidly. So I think if yeah. Hillary Clinton gets elected, we're going It'll to have her vice president running the country. And an Kane. interesting name, I know, Kane. That is quite interesting. Well, this is a fascinating topic, and we've only just scratched the surface of it. So, uh, you know, again, we urge you to look for the uh, the interview uh, which uh, in which Tom Horn sat in uh, at uh, the in the archives at SkyWatchTV.com. But uh, mainly. Get yourself a copy of the film. Tom Horn calls this the best documentary he has ever seen, bar none, any genre, any topic. True Legends, The Unholy Sea, writer, director, Timothy Alberino. Tim, uh, we appreciate you making the trip up here to uh, talk about this. This is uh, mind-blowing stuff. I'm always excited to come to Skywatch TV. <laughs> mm. And this is why we do what we do. There is more to heaven and earth than is dreamt of in our philosophy, Horatio. Thank you for watching as we keep watch. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is Skywatch TV. see. Watch this. say this thing had been dead for maybe a day or two. Uh, we estimated his size at approximately 12 to 10 feet tall. The giant killed the first team that they came across. He was extremely big and fast and agile for a guy that size. The popes and the agents of the Holy See have known about the giants for many centuries. And do you believe that they have artifacts from the past that would help explain some of what's going on? Absolutely sure. The Vatican knows all the secrets. Angels waging war in the unseen realm. Global events 
Fulfilling biblical prophecy. Eternal life. What lies beyond mortality? From analyzing the paranormal from a biblical worldview to the discussion of cutting edge science and technology. Conspiracy. Discovery. Special investigative reports. Unafraid to explore the challenging issues facing humanity. Welcome to another edition of Skywatch TV. The greatest cover-up in history is the cover-up of history. So says Steve Quayle. Welcome to Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. Our guest today, the director and producer, director and uh, writer and star of the new film. The topic today, True Legends, The Unholy. In studio with me, my best friend and wife, co-host of Sci Friday on the Skywatch TV channel on Roku, Sharon Gilbert. Hi, honey. Hi, sweetheart. And the uh, writer and director of True Legends, The Unholy Sea, Tim Alberino. Tim, welcome. Pleasure to be here. Uh, You're supposed to say hi, honey. Well, hi, honey. Yeah, but, uh, see, thank see you. that's my motivation. <laughs> uh, Steve, in the, in the film, uh, Steve Quayle, who produced the film, uh, said the greatest cover-up in history is the cover-up of history. How, what does he mean? Well, uh, that the, the history of the pre-flood world is, is, has been completely covered over and covered up, literally. That, that we have evidence, and there exists evidence all over the earth of the dynamics of the reality of the pre-flood world um, and, and the Genesis 6 narrative that has been intentionally ignored uh, at best, and in many cases, intentionally covered over, hmm. and uh, artifacts have been confiscated. History has been literally rewritten, and um, the the archaeology. Secretly preparing for the arrival of alien saviors. They seem to be intentionally creating dogma that is going to position the Roman Catholic Church to be at the forefront of an official disclosure moment. The Vatican is involved in ufology in ways that they can't even imagine. So while we're standing here in the headquarters of the Jesuits, tell us about Mount Graham. They are constantly monitoring things with the Lucifer device. Sometimes they have to wait for all of the UFOs to get out of the way. I would like to tell you more about Zechariah's teaching. He told me, John Mario, one night I wake up and I saw an Anunnaki sitting on my bed. History is being repeated. The days of Noah are returning. The gods are returning to the earth to dwell among men and mingle their seed with the human race. Only the truth can prepare us for the lie that's coming. 